In this episode, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Margaret McCartney back on the podcast. Dr. McCartney is a practicing GP in Glasgow, who many of you will know from her writing and contributions towards Radio 4's Inside Health. Uh, Margaret is particularly interested in evidence-based medicine, um, a recent theme in this podcast, as well as science communication. For example, surrounding screening programs, which we explore particularly in relation to COVID testing, communication of uncertainty, um, and transparency in science. Um, It's a mark of how much things have changed over the last year that we last recorded using Skype when we spoke in November 2019. In this episode, we jump around between a number of interesting and very important topics, including the challenges and indeed importance of good communication during the pandemic, the role of such communication in changing people's minds and what makes it easy and difficult for people to change their minds. We also talk about communication of uncertainty um, and some of the nuances there. We talk a bit about the differences that have emerged between investigating the efficacy of drugs and, on the other hand, non-drug interventions, and really the importance of getting better evidence, in particular for uh, non-drug interventions, uh, which was the topic of a BMJ article by Margaret that I'd really recommend reading. We also touch upon the difficulties that there are sometimes in assessing how well medicine is actually working, um, with our particular focus on general practice in this case. We jump in at the beginning, however, with a look at what we really mean by expertise. This has been brought particularly into light by the pandemic, but I think it's such a really interesting issue both within it and outside it. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy the episode. One of the things I was thinking about, actually, was about what gives me the right to say anything about anything. Because in the news over the last year, so many people have had opinions and said things that some of them have turned out to be right, some of them have turned out to be very wrong. And I was reflecting on the nature of who speaks and what and why and to what purpose and who's oh, yeah. an expert and who's got authority. And, I, you know, I was wondering whether I've got the right to say anything, really. You know, I'm a general practitioner. I, you know, I've, I'm not a researcher. I'm not an expert in infectious diseases I'm not an epidemiologist you know there's lots of things I'm very much not and it's um one of the things I, I have been reflect on a lot is when is it appropriate to say things when is it not appropriate to say things and um, what is the role of a general practitioner in all of this because obviously we're in the intersection of lots of things we're at the intersection of public health of epidemiology of um, applications of evidence of thinking about hazard side effects you know the, the, the vaccination schedule for example deciding on the hoof that you weren't going to give people their second vaccine at the time they were expecting but to delay it for three months all this kind of stuff and general practice is at that kind of maelstrom sort of intersection of it all and it's i and i've been thinking about it i don't know what to think about it except that i suppose it makes me feel quite cautious sometimes about um making well making sure that people know where i'm coming from i suppose mm. i'm not an expert i'm a general I thought we, should we start off by um, with that yeah. actually as I yeah, My first thought I went to say that was, well, it depends what you're saying. If you're saying something people like, then yeah. um, suddenly all of your credentials mean yeah. a lot. If you're saying something that they don't like, then suddenly people could be a lot more critical of what people's training and background is yeah. in something. And I think it's interesting for, from a perspective of general practice, you can see huge mistakes made by specialists who know a lot about one particular thing, um, but lack that broad insight um, yeah. perhaps into... Yeah, other areas and things they're missing. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose everyone's got something to contribute, haven't they? But, you know, sometimes it's interesting because I've been knowing someone for, you know, maybe, you know, 15 or 16 years and I know why they've decided to take or not to take medication and they go to a clinic and someone with the best will in the world has asked them to start something which I know that they've made a long-term decision not to take and, you know, there, there may or may not be repercussions from that. But no one's acting, no one's a bad actor, if you know what I mean. It's just that different bits of information fit into different places and different times differently and people's perspectives have to be different from each other so you know mistakes are inevitable you mm. know recommendations that don't work out in real life are inevitable but mm. um, yeah I think specialists can learn from generalists and also generalists can learn from specialists too. Mm. Actually one question I was thinking of just there is that when do you personally decide that actually this is almost my my topic to talk about and have the idea that you're the best person to speak on that topic? Because it, presumably the, everyone has this kind of balance between uh, do I give my opinion on it or do I point towards somebody else who I feel is expressing the same things with more clarity or more expertise or I simply just don't have the time to explain these. Yeah, Where yeah. do you think you stand on that? 
Yeah, so that's that's really interesting because I think um especially at the beginning of the um of the pandemic, I got loads of media requests in to do stuff. And I don't particularly I like to do the stuff that I do for Radio 4 and I like to do more in writing because then I'm doing what I want to do rather than what someone else is asking me, which I don't often know. But the things that I feel really passionate about and I feel as though I do have in-depth knowledge about are things to do with risk communication, with screening, with testing. But there are also people that know far more about that than I do because they work in a different perspective that work in laboratories, that have had long experience with testing things, that have set up screening programmes, that have written um, information leaflets for people, you know, so, so I don't have um, expertise like that. I would say I've got a broad and, and fairly deep general knowledge, I'm sure not as deep as it could be or perhaps should be, but, um, but that's the kind of stuff I, I suppose I feel passionate about. And I remember I went on the Today programme very early on when people were putting out models. And my, my, the only thing I really wanted to say was that all models have uncertainty attached to them. They all come with assumptions. And unless we can be clear about those assumptions, we won't be clear about where the margins of our certainty are. But I wasn't making any comment about the sums or the maths or just a, more of a kind of issue with how we interpret these in real life. And I felt that was OK to say, but I certainly wouldn't have been commenting on the accuracy of models or how you build models but what I needed to know was what assumptions are being made when we put the numbers into these models are we assuming that test and trace works are we assuming that our borders are closed are we assuming that people are able to follow isolation advice that that kind of stuff um, mm. but then I, I basically I, I don't think I did hardly any media I think I wrote something for the Guardian early on saying we need science we need evidence we need, we need to test our assumptions and then it all I mean it all went a bit crazy I think the whole response has been very very odd very bizarre in many ways and um, and basically I, I think I've turned down about 99% of the stuff that I've been asked to do and a lot of places just don't come to me now for, for comment on stuff which is great well I'm because glad you agreed to come on, on, on here then the, the, the <laughs> Very proud to be part of it. <laughs> yeah, this is this is um, but this is a different thing because we're having a conversation about stuff, and it's um, I think that's very different. But you know, I don't have the expertise to go on and talk about you know whether you should lock down now or later, or whether you should I don't know um, you know so many of the decisions that have been made about um, you know the models and how much certainty attached to them. I can say that there are uncertainties, but you know deciding what you do with that is a completely different set of skills. I think. Mm. I guess I think I have two things to add here. One is that perhaps I've seen following and fame associated with expertise quite a lot in, in the media. And it might, there, there might just be a product of the fact that people who have a high profile are easier to find on certain yeah. topics, but then drawing them in to talk about topics that perhaps their expertise is a little bit far away from um, yeah. can be a bit dangerous. And also yeah. actually the, um, the idea that, although you say you might not be an expert in something, do you have that worry that actually you might be replaced by somebody who knows even less. Yeah, and I, I mean, perhaps, I suppose, in quite often in media work, people are looking for two opposing points of view. You know, they're looking for someone that's for something and someone that's against something. And you get this whole issue then of false balance as well. But then I think there's also rational criticisms or rational concerns. But the problem is that in this pandemic, what's happened is that you've had a rational concern. And if I presented something with what I hope has been reasonableness and about um, fairness, I suppose, to the research questions, things like that can be latched onto by people who are very much of the extreme polar views um, and wouldn't listen to any other evidence if it was if it was for or against them they would they wouldn't um, they, they wouldn't change their nothing would change their mind really so it's very difficult to kind of try and tread a path where you're being reasonable and fair and sometimes i think having a generalist perspective can kind of help a bit with that but equally Equally, I think that you're correct in that sometimes if you don't get somebody that's more central to speak on a topic, you might get someone who's a, an outlier. And the problem is you might not know who the outlier is until quite a while afterwards. <laughs> so very difficult, I think. And I wonder if this this kind of fear of people um, taking things in a different way to which you intended, regardless of your attempts to uh, kind of steer the conversation to a rational measured discussion i wonder if that's something that ultimately just is going to happen with some groups we find what them um, confirmation bias we find what we what we want to find and if not we switch off and we move towards a different media network that does provide what we want yeah. 
there is this idea as well when you you know when you take stuff off social media you know so there was a big push on facebook to take off fake news and, and i completely get that i don't do facebook but um but, but from what i can understand is that there's a lot of kind of um what's happened is that rather than um fake news or bad science being visible to other people it's kind of been driven underground and i do wonder whether an unintended consequence of quite rightly clearing up bad news misinformation you know conspiracy theories might actually have the effect for some people of making it um, making it appear that there really is a conspiracy because no one will let you talk about this and I don't know um, what the best way is to deal with that but I suppose it just does concern me and it's the same thing that happened um, in America where they made um, vaccinations compulsory for children to get to school and then the big concern was that the very children who needed to go to school were maybe being excluded from school by their parents who didn't want them to have a vaccination and would then seek alternative health care for them they would seek homeopathy when they were really sick stuff like that and um, so I, I don't I don't know what the best um, answer is you know but I think whatever you do there's going to be some kind of consequence from it that you have to think about. A strange analogy here with kind of drug legalization and harm reduction whether actually if if you make um, particular viewpoints, perhaps which aren't that far from the, the scientific consensus, um, if you drive them underground and people are forced to go underground to get them, there are a number of other sources of information there that could actually be far more destructive. And suddenly you're not just fed things about vaccine scepticism, you're fed 5G as well. And um, without having this kind of measured conversation in the open, it could be quite destructive. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I think there's clustering of misinformation, as you rightfully say. You, it's rare to get a, a site that's purely anti-vaccination. There's usually several other concerns in there that people have that are kind of fed into. And of course, if you go from one bad site to another bad site to another bad site, you're maybe not getting any opportunity to get more balanced or fair or, or less, less untrue science. Mm. And perhaps by the time you actually um, come to speak with somebody who has a slightly differing opinion, you're at risk of being far more convinced in your views because i'm sure there are things that i feel very strongly about now almost a year into the pandemic that actually earlier on i'd have probably been a lot more malleable on absolutely yeah and, and there's that thing as well with it we you know what would it take you to change your mind you know so i don't know if you saw there was a really interesting article by george davy smith and colleagues in the bmj just basically writing down a list of all the things they've been wrong about in the pandemic so far and i, I think it's really important to be able to say like i was wrong about this or actually now i've got better information i i think something differently but I suppose what I've learned I suppose in, the, in the last um, few years in particular is that if you want to change people's minds, you have to make it easy for people to change their minds. You have to make it not embarrassing. You have to make it a good thing to do. You have to welcome people to do that. Because um, I think sometimes there's a kind of gotcha aspect in, in medicine, I think, particularly, that if you um, end up thinking something's different from how you started, that should, you should be congratulated on that rather than um, shamed for it. And I think um, we must do the same for members of the public you know if, if you um, want to help somebody um, understand the evidence around vaccination you should be helpful and kind not beating someone up for you know verbally or, or you know or metaphorically for having a different point of view to you you know most people want to do the right thing I believe and um, I think um, I think sometimes some of the tensions um, assume that there's bad actors and sometimes there are you know clearly there are but the vast majority of times people are trying to do the right thing for themselves or from their family you know it's interesting when the last when the MMR crisis was full on you know lots of them um, lots of people had you know they built kind of science sites to explain the science or do x y and z but what we found was the most <laughs> most valuable thing was um, having a long-term relationship with our patients um, and also saying you know I was very happy to get my children vaccinated and that kind of stuff actually, I think, made well where, where I work. I think made more of a difference than lots of other things. So you have to make it easy for people, not hard. I think that speaks to just building that trust on topics that are separate from the one that you're kind of debating and arguing over. Um, yeah, you're, in you're that moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You don't, you, you know, trust to be something that you deserve rather than something that you just um, grant to somebody. You know, you, you should have a basis for that. You can't just assume that you should trust whoever is saying, you know, believe the science, the science is right, you know, let us give this vaccination to you. You have to have some kind of moral compass that allows you to make that judgment on someone. Yeah, absolutely. The, the responsibility of of doctors more um, more broadly to form more of a consensus amongst themselves before going 
um, public and speaking to the media. And um, this is a, a quite a long kind of winded way of, of saying I've seen um, some, some doctors come out there and um, be criticised for giving very one sided um, opinions on things. And the badge of being a doctor is in itself an enormous platform and yeah. a responsibility. And I think sometimes people haven't thought things through. Sometimes there are ul- ulterior motives at play, but... Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I suppose what, what is expertise? It's that whole thing, what we were talking about, what's, what gives you the right to say something? And I think for a lot of the general public, they perhaps don't mean don't know the difference between different types of doctors. You know, a doctor who's an expert in infection may not be an expert in disease control, also may not be an expert in epidemiology, you know. So that, then there's lots of people who have trained as one thing, but then practice in another area, and I've got huge expertise in that as well. So I, I, think, it is, I think it is remarkably difficult for the public to work out who and what trust and I suppose it's that thing about personal relationships when it comes down to things like vaccination and things like that it's, it's very different individual health care from public health care but you but you're right having said that I do think people have got a right to a, a right to say what they what they think um, mm, and a right to be wrong as well and um, I suppose and if you don't allow that then you're very much buying into the idea about your your free speech is being withheld you're not allowed to speak you've been shut down by the medical establishment all this all this kind of stuff and there clearly are some um, medically qualified individuals who have um who have benefited from misinformation or from whatever you know in the pandemic absolutely there's also i think medically qualified people who have made honest mistakes and certainly you know i have i never thought for a moment there would be a vaccination available at this point you know there's never been a vaccination against the coronavirus has been effective I, I was completely wrong I was kind of thinking god that's that's not going to be the way we're going to get out of this now yes yeah, sure there's still loads of uncertainties about vaccination and what impact it will have but we have a vaccine you know that's been approved which is a million miles away from where I where I thought it would be so yeah I mean I think everyone is wrong about stuff and I think everyone should have the right to say what they think but whether you should listen to them or whether anyone else should listen to them is the other problem and I don't know and in terms of consensus building yes I can see where you're coming from, but there's lots of consensus. Is it consensus? Is that the plural? <laughs> is it a plural of consensus? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this idea that, you know, because there was different, you know, universities were coming out with different models, you know, at the start and who's right. And clearly they had consensus within their groups. And then there was a wider debate um, about who was right and who was wrong. So, you know, so I suppose the public get different messages from that as well there can be more than one type of consensus and more than one group of consensus and generally when there's consensus or when there are many consensi um, generally speaking that's when the science has got lots of gaps in it and when there's lots of uncertainties and uh, something I feel really passionate about is that I don't think we've been honest and open about is the uncertainties that we're dealing with all the way through this and Mm. it should be okay to say I don't know it should be okay to say yeah you can do that but there's major gaps we might not be benefiting anybody from doing this Um, to me it's the the one wrong thing you can do is claim certainty when there isn't anything to be certain mm. about. Yes, and I wonder. I guess I didn't when I was saying consensus. I, I guess I didn't mean that we oh, should. No, it's fine. No, you yeah. Opinions. I'm more. Um, I more thought that actually. Um, if you have two groups presenting their their view on something without having discussed it with each other, they could come yeah. to a consensus at a, at a later stage. But that's perhaps not something that many of their the members of their audience are exposed to yeah. later on as far as they're concerned this one yeah. thing was said and there hasn't been this later discussion this later kind of change as all these different parties have been involved in what i think flourishing science is yeah. is about yeah, no, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry for misinterpreting no no, no, no that's okay it's, but it's my fault no, 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 not at all. no you're completely right and i suppose the other issue is that most of the time these kind of arguments are not about a pandemic and they're happening not exactly not behind closed doors but they're happening in journals they're happening at academic meetings you know they're not happening in the daily mail and on the front page of the guardian <laughs> And I wonder also about this, you were talking about uncertainties and actually acknowledging them and also acknowledging um, the mistakes have been made as well. And I feel there are two camps here. There's the camp that believes that admitting to mistakes and admitting to uncertainties um, is therefore almost poking holes in the other things that you've been saying. Um, And then I think there's the slightly more kind of evidence-based camp. I know David Spiegelholt has done some work on this about actually if you convey uncertainty, you don't decrease people's trust in the information that you're putting across. I wonder if you could talk about that for a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah, David's work's brilliant, and um, um, Alex Freeman as well. They've done some super work about this. So, so my interest in this was peaked when um, I realised that people who were having a negative test for COVID virus were being texted the result by saying, um, "You did not have COVID virus." You, yes, I saw this come up at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I found this just. Um, I was so distressed by this because um, it could have meant that up to a third of people um, were getting the wrong results. So we know that um, the, the test is wrong, the false negative rate is around about 30% for PCR self-testing around about that nobody really knows for sure but it's certainly sizable and the problem with the test system is that if you have got your fever your asnosmia or your um fever asnosmia or your cough your consistent cough how could i how could i forget <laughs> um, <laughs> then you phone up and you make your appointment for your test and if it's negative then you're told your test is negative and that's you you don't interact with a healthcare professional during that so nobody is taking account of your clinical symptoms and i've had lots of patients who have had none of those symptoms and who have been fairly certain that they've got coronavirus and I have told them to ignore their negative test and proceed as it's positive you know they've been living in a household where they have had you know a couple of positive testing members and they have a headache and some diarrhea uh, that, there's no way I'm going to say you don't have coronavirus you know so the, the whole idea of pretest probability about you know your clinical thinking skills seems to have been kind of thrown out the window and despite requests for the government to widen their criteria for testing when when the rate is so high as it is just now it has fallen on deaf ears you know it's different when the rates are very low and when your rates are really high as they are just now you have to be much more cautious i think um, and so tell people who've got symptoms that are very likely to be COVID in a pandemic when the rates are really high that they can be reassured with the negative test when the neg false negative rate is so high it's just terrible <laughs> it's yes. such a, you know it's such a, an area we could improve on and yet we haven't mm. And that comes down to, I guess, what all these tests and investigations are, which are just shifting the probabilities that are in your mind. But those depend so much on, as you said, the pretest probabilities, yeah. whether somebody's got symptoms, whether somebody's been in contact with, um, yeah. with somebody, for example, and th the nature of them. And it really drives home this notion of unintended harms. And now we're getting on to some of the, um, some of the questions that I wrote down a few days ago. <laughs> this idea of when we're talking about non-drug interventions that... Uh, we frequently, you wrote a wonderful piece in the BMJ a few months ago about it, that we can frequently discount some of the potential harms of these interventions. Um, whilst we're very clear that um, drugs have various side effects potentially, um, the idea that testing or mass testing doesn't have side effects, for example, well, reducing um, people's suspicion that they have COVID and therefore leading to changes to their behaviour um, yeah. because they're acting as if they didn't have it. I wonder here why we do discount these very real and very potential harms um, in these scenarios. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, this is the answer. <laughs> but the factors that I think are likely to be important are the fact that, for example, the World Health Organization had or pre-organized, you know, before the next pandemic, how you would do randomized control trials in the context of a pandemic. But the emphasis was very much on drugs, not on non-drug interventions. So all those kind of thoughts and processes and networks had already been set up, so they were ready to roll when the next pandemic came. And which has been fantastic you know there's been excellent trials done you know my hat has taken off to them but the same as i say wasn't done for non-drug interventions and i suppose you know in medicine in general there's been a huge emphasis on hospital-based care on mm. you know um, stuff that happens in in big shiny places and i suppose the story of medicine is that the stuff that happens outside of hospitals where most people are tends to get a bit less attention overall now whether that is a factor here i don't know it, it's so it's less sexy i suppose it's less glamorous to be doing testing of things that might seem superficially to be a bit less um, exciting and of course it's always um exciting to do something that very visibly works in a shorter set of time more quickly and it's easier to organize um, compared to say doing a trial of face coverings in the community which would be difficult to organize which would take a lot of effort which would require a lot of different agencies to get involved um, I, and, uh, and I suspect funders um, often don't see the value in that in the same way that they do see a drug intervention as having value. So I suppose it's, um, it's a very medicalised approach to research, I suppose. Mm -hmm. The stats come to mind that a million patient account encounters per day in general practice. And yeah. I think nearly, I, I don't know if it's nearly over half of doctors work in general practice currently yet. Um, yeah. Focus is suddenly on shiny hospitals. 
Yeah, um, I suppose you want. I mean, we need our hospitals. But I love my yeah. hospital colleagues. This is not an anti-hospital rant for me. I promise. <laughs> it's more just about, I think, just acknowledging where it is that the majority of care happens, and also that there are lots of relationships in primary care that can really help with this kind of thing. You know, general practitioners have been doing flu vaccinations, you know, forever, and I've got a really good understanding of the local community, local networks, local resources. I mean, everywhere is going to be different. You know, there's not all GP surgeries will be able to take on and do the mass vaccinations, but some of that has been made more difficult by the way it's been set up you know people were told they had to vaccinate for 12 hours a day for example now if you're a rural surgery um somewhere that runs with one gp and a practice nurse you know i, I think you should be able to adapt as long as you're not wasting vaccine in the process if you're using a vaccine that's, that's stable and, and can be um, used over several days or whatever you know, I think there should be some flexibility in there. And I suppose one of the issues with the pandemic is it's been managed on an industrial scale, I would say, rather than a public health scale. Public health has got nuance, you know, you've got your national, you've got your regional, you've got your local public health departments, and they do understand their communities. But instead of that, I think it's moved up a gear into this, it's been administered by, you know, management consultancies at an industrial level, where it's very hard, I think, to penetrate through into the subtleties of human relationships in a difficult world. You know, what do you do for, you know, a 90 year old person who can't here well has a daughter that can bring her up but only on a Tuesday afternoon uh, you know what you know how does a call mm. center mitigate for that you know I, I mean my receptionists in the practice are amazing they will you know someone will come in and they will know they, you know they will know what to do because of their huge experience and in, in knowing their community for so many years and that can't be replicated by a call center 200 miles away and I guess this uh, perhaps speaks to the need to or ha have this discussion with central government, central regulators, regulators, public health England about these are the things we need help with. And these are the things that we are best to manage on our own at a local level. And totally, totally. I suppose it's, it's um, one of the, one of the traumas that general practice has had, I think, over the last 30 years is proving its value, you know, and people look for different ways to try and prove that general practice works. And, um, you know, in the quality and outcomes framework, I think, has been an, an example of that. You know, th did your doctor ask you if you want to stop smoking? Yes, no. Are you obese? Yes, no. That kind of very binary sort of thing. And, and I think what, what it always struggles to exemplify is um, the value that people have in it or the relationships that people have in it and what results on on those basis and i think the problem is that when you come into a pandemic you know and you're looking to do lots of stuff it's very easy to kind of not know what general practice is doing because all you've done is measure it on your you, the measurables you decided a long time ago that were never designed to, to look at relationships or to look at um you know all the things that don't happen you know all the heart attacks that don't happen the strokes that don't happen the suicides that don't happen it's very hard to prove that what you were doing made stuff not happen <laughs> I think of writing something or making some podcast episodes on kind of medical education. And I thought of the question, how do we know that medicine works in general? I yeah. think it's actually quite a difficult, it's quite a difficult one yeah. to do. We don't have a, we don't have randomized control trials that say this region is going to get a hospital and this one isn't, or, or you're well, registered actually, to your GP and you, actually, can't, and you can't visit that. Or do we, yeah. or, or do we, am I, am I completely no, wrong? No, there's, really, there's a lady, um, Barbara Starfield, um, American doctor, has written some fantastic stuff about what happens when you increase general practice in areas. And she has made, you know, made lots of associations between what happens when you've got better primary care, um, for example, but that was maybe, you know, a little while ago now. But, um, and certainly there's lots of um, instances, um, lots of associations where you put services in, they get used, but whether or not they're used in a way that benefits people is, is another question, I suppose. And I suppose you can look at specific diseases, you can look at heart attack strokes, you can look at HIV, you can look at, you know, sort of, I suppose, what's happened to diseases once research and stuff has happened. But I remember when I wrote my first book, um, Patient Paradox, I wrote a bit in it saying, you know, I can't prove the medicine works overall, but if it is proven to be harmful, I've got several other career strategies planned. <laughs> <laughs> I'd still quite like to follow them, actually. <laughs> I'd like to have a second career somewhere. Oh, yes, my um, my conclusion was, well, everyone seems to believe that it works. So I'm going to go from that perspective at first, maybe pick it apart a bit later, um, yeah, a bit later yeah. on, which is quite handy yeah. given I've committed a few years to, uh, yeah. to study. Well, I suppose that's, the, that's eminence-based medicine, the vision of George, which is the, the lowest part of evidence that we like to talk about or don't like to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> The easy endpoints to measure, going back to what you just said earlier, uh, are not necessarily the most informative endpoints overall. Yeah. And I think we do end up with quite a few 
tick box exercises that are almost not um, in themselves assessed in an evidence-based way, despite the fact that they're trying to get so-called evidence-based information out about a service. Yeah, yeah, and I think there is evidence that as soon as you start measuring something, it no longer becomes a useful measure because you game your systems in order to meet that measure, and then other things go to pot instead. You know, and I think general practice is almost a wicked problem. You know, you solve one area of it, but at the cost of another area. You know, and so you're going around in a perpetual circle. And um, when when most general practices are, are practitioners are pragmatists who are trying to do the best they can with the resources they've got on the day that it is. You know, so uh, yeah. So how would you? How would you, because um, lots of regions have their own strengths, different practices have their own strengths, and we want different practices to learn from each other what the strengths of other ones are, what they're doing that um, that works. If we are finding difficult to measure how well different techniques and different approaches are working, do you have any suggestions for how to kind of go, um, go forwards here? Yeah, well, so for a few years in Scotland we haven't had co-op the same as they have in England and the idea was you would have them um, you would have cluster groups instead and you would discuss what works and what doesn't work and and you would have this kind of sharing sort of knowledge and, and information and actually the most useful thing about it has been finding out resources that are available to our patients that we didn't know about or weren't told about that's been the most important thing is that you know in some areas so some practices have access to a service that we didn't know we could get access to or we could apply for access to and things so it's been that that kind of stuff that's actually been the most useful is that kind of just local intelligence that we've had um, but but you know they started off doing things like showing us how many referrals we'd had say for example to neurology compared to the practice down the road and it was kind of like well what are you going to do about it so, well, <laughs> I don't even know what this data means you know it's like good is it bad like you know how yeah. different are our patients from each other are these appropriate referrals or the inappropriate referrals what's a yeah, good referral one, like, like, one you know, could be right one could be wrong both could be right both could be wrong exactly, um, exactly. and also what is wrong you know like so say for example the patient who I'm fairly convinced has got a particular diagnosis doesn't need referred but for various reasons really wants to be referred and I think it would be an appropriate thing for me to write and say you know this is what I think this is what the patient thinks can you advise us you know that that's you know you know so so how do you judge that kind of stuff you know mm. I, I don't know if you can very easily you could label it as a as a failure overall without having talked to those individuals actually involved in it at which point yeah. you realize it's a much more appropriate yeah. decision yeah and I remember once we got this and um, there was another one they sent through which was how many blood tests were done and again you know how, how do you judge the right amount of blood tests to be done in the practice and um, and they said that we hadn't requested any B12 over the last year and I was completely wrong uh, you know so there was kind of quite simple errors that we had to end up going back through and checking and, and basically saying well this is just incorrect you know yeah. I haven't got the right data here at all but a huge amount of effort you know it took from us to kind of respond to all of these points that are put to us and a lot of the time all you can say is you know well thank you for telling us that but we're not quite sure what it means you know so i, I for me the best thing about um the best thing you can do in terms of learning from other practices is just go and talk go and talk to them and that has been one of the upsides i think about our cluster working arrangements is that we talk to each other but of course all we've talked about for the last kind of year or so has been the pandemics <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and one thing um, I think I'm right in saying actually talking about cancer referrals in particular is yeah. the 3% index of suspicion, which always struck me as slightly odd because um, it didn't seem to take into account what you you were referring people for. Something might might be perfectly reasonable to have 20, uh, well, 32 out of 33 false negatives, as it were, being, refer um, being referred on and for some other ones with um, much more invasive interventions that are going to be ordered in secondary care it might be yeah. appropriate to have a higher percentage um, yeah. threshold yeah. for it yeah 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 and I, I suppose um my big issue with the whole early, early diagnosis stuff has been that the techniques that we're using have been to um to divide patients up into your kind of urgent ones then your less urgent ones and then your routine ones and I just don't think that we're safe enough to do that, you know, and I think it'd probably be much safer to say, okay, everyone needs to be seen within, say, six weeks, rather than, you know, some people are safe to wait 18 months, which is what is effectively happening. So you need to, um, you know, the, the question is, do you have good rule out tests? Your rule in tests, you know, you might say are, you know, sometimes accurate, but often they're not at all accurate. And your rule out tests might actually not be very good at all. So you're really, um, I think what you're really doing, you're not so much 
identifying the people that you think are at high risk, what you're doing is you're trying to identify the people who are at lower risk that can wait for longer. And that just worries me because that's a bigger group and a, <laughs> and a bigger group is likely to have more risk inside it. So uh, that that's that's what I worry about. You know, they're just, you know, they're, they're, there's more people. So if the patients are, if you're missing lots of people, that's going to add up cumulatively and I just worry about it and we know that there's been lots of these awareness campaigns about you know breast lumps or about you know referring people urgently for you know um there was a one that was done for oral um lesions oral problems and there was another couple and what you do is you get a big upswing and people being referred but actually no more people that have got cancer in them so your question is where where are those people then and they're probably distributed in the waiting list system somewhere else so i don't know but it, it, it i don't know for sure but it just worries me it just worries me because you know it's not binary and sometimes people look at very distressing symptoms and i want to refer them to see if something can be done to help their symptoms and it might not be cancer that's top of the list but in terms of their quality of life it's very poor and sometimes I think it could be used to downgrade that group of people which I think is a bit unfair. How do you approach these conversations with with your patients because I assume various various patients will have very different opinions on what is a high risk what is a what is a low risk and as you said it could be very distressing to suspect that um, perhaps you found maybe a lump on your breast and it could be cancer. Some might be happy to actually, when you give the explanation, actually, um, here's the data here yeah. for individuals um, like you, the vast majority doesn't. Um, yeah. How do you go about having almost these conversations in a, in a rational way for what could be quite scary times? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. And everything's so abnormal just now, because normally you would get a bit of support, a bit of help from your friends or your family, you know, be seeing people a lot more. And I think sometimes when people are isolated and they don't have that normal kind of sense check from friends and family, people can feel much more anxious and, and concerned than, than compared with what they would normally. So, so you're right, it is abnormal times. And you, you're absolutely right. Some people would regard what I think as being low risk as being very high risk and vice versa. So, and I suppose that's the whole thing about you know, evidence-based medicine is very much meant to encompass patients' values. So if you're thinking about statin for someone, you know, um, if I if I was told I had a 25% risk of a heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years, I'd be like, oh my God, that's so high. But I know other people who say, that's fine. You know, 75% of the time I won't, and I'm quite happy with that. So, <laughs> so, um, so there's, you, you, there's lots of interpretations of exactly the same data. Uh, and I think you just have to give that back to people and allow them to come to the judgment that they will. But then you have a responsibility towards the evidence and towards equity and, and safety as well. So you want to make sure that you're using the resources you have wisely and not doing something mm. purely because of a non-evidence-based concern or fear. Because then, you know, if you refer to someone urgently that you're, you know, you know, as certain as you possibly can be is not an urgent thing. There's effectively, you're pushing someone else down in the system. Mm. Um, and another th spanner to be thrown into this works is screening, which almost ma magnifies the numbers in these scenarios and turns many people into patients that they would not necessarily have been. I know that you've had a number of concerns about some of the screening programs um, that have been offered. Um, yeah. How would you kind of divide those, those concerns up? Yeah, I mean, the big issue just now is going to be screening for COVID, isn't it? So that's the, the big, enormous one that's coming up is this idea that you're going to test people with no symptoms to see whether or not they've got coronavirus. And, and the government has bought, I think, £494 million pounds worth of lateral flow tests that were subsequently um, deemed by the manufacturer to be not suitable for screening tests. And then the government did their own evaluation and decided that they could be used for screening tests, even though we know that these self-taking tests miss about 43% of people who have got COVID. So this is a concern to me um, because we haven't had any high quality evidence to say that this will actually in practice work. It hasn't gone through the UK National Screening Committee who should really be our arbiters of um, making sure that screening offers that are made to the public are rational, evidence-based and quality assured. And that's not happened for these tests. And um, there's been lots of media stuff today, actually, as we're talking about whether or not these are going to be used in schools, whether teachers are going to be asked to administer them or pupils. Um, and the MHRA, as I understand, has has rejected the idea that people should self-test, which is good. Um, but, but it's hard to know what's going to happen next because it seems to be driven very much by um, policymakers and politicians rather than by public health officials and by the UK NSC, who are the organisation who should be in charge of this 
Um, and that was one I remember hearing Jonathan Deeks talk about it on the BMJ's podcast, talking about how strikingly they weren't even allowed to name some of these tests that they'd been investigating because of deals with the manufacturers. They would just test one, two, three, four. They could say how accurate they were, but you couldn't actually put um, the data to a particular test that might be out there being um, yeah. being sold. It almost seems like there's a there's a there's a conflict. And if they were drugs, you know, if that was if that was four different types of ACE inhibitor or whatever else, I mean, you know, people would be saying, "What are you, you know, this is appalling. You know, why why are we not being told what these um, subjects being tested are? You know, with public money, you know, it, it, you know, it's extraordinary how um, how careful we are with drug and vaccination trials, and yet with them um, with test kits, we seem to be you know led by policy rather than by science. You know, even just admitting that there might be an issue here or there might be things we should mitigate for doesn't seem to be happening. Mm. And it seems like actually with uh, with testing in particular, one avenue towards improving things is this greater communication with the public around uncertainty. So I think 43% of cases missed. Um, yeah. This greater communication um, about what these things are useful for and what they aren't. So rather than getting your negative test, your, ne- your negative lateral flow and saying, oh, brilliant, I don't have COVID, actually saying, ah, oh, brilliant, um, it's now twice as likely that I'm negative at this current stage, for example. So I, I think um, I think that what you could reasonably say is if it's positive, then it's very likely to be a true positive. And there are concerns about, you know, um, how long they're positive for and so forth. But I think um, if it's positive, then it's, it's very likely to be correct. It's just if it's negative, then I think you probably should ignore that. Because um, the, the concern is that if people get negative tests, then they feel as though they're free from COVID. And then they can um, go off and do what they like. So some of the local authorities that are, have put information about this test on their websites, they're saying things like him you know if you were negative and um, you don't have covid and um, but still be careful because you might catch it before your next test as opposed to saying the test might be wrong would you say that part of this comes from from the assumption uh, again that the harms are um are reduced by the fact that people can't do anything anyway we're in lockdown people shouldn't be able to spread it the negative test shouldn't um shouldn't mean anything anyway whereas actually it ignores human behavior fundamentally and uh, i know when i get i know the reassurance i get from a negative test even if i look slightly into it and think oh I'm <laughs> right. um, yeah yeah is it i mean i just i just don't think we know um there was a study done um September, I think, um, which asked people what their intention was if they were told to isolate, um, did they, would they intend to isolate? And you know, a huge majority said, I would absolutely intend to isolate. But then they asked people um, what happened when they were asked to isolate, and only a minority actually managed to follow the letter of the, the guidance as to what to do. So, so in many ways, what you've got to do, I think, is take people's good intentions and actually make it easy for them to isolate. You know, what do people need? To, uh, I understand that in Germany, what, what happens is if you have to isolate, um, you've got a phone call and you get a phone call every day and I understand it's being done by medical students who are asking you know how are you what do you need can I get you anything and um, you know just a bit of moral support I think as well and I think um, things like that have got a real potential to help rather than um, just <laughs> just abandoning people with a positive test and sort of saying well you know you'll just need to apply for some money and here's the forms and they're quite difficult you know um, we have to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing which at the end of the day they've asked majority of people actually want to do. Perhaps there's this uh, assumption that making it easy for people to do the right thing is incredibly costly and incredibly incredibly difficult whereas actually if we can if we can show that just checking in and having a medical student check in with somebody is going to increase the likelihood or uh, prioritizing food delivery slots for them there are probably quite a lot of small things that can be done um, that don't consist of paying people thousands and thousands of pounds as the daily mail would um, suspect to spend. And I think you could try all these kind of interventions. You know, you could yes, try. Them. We could have done this months ago. We could have said, okay, what happens? And um, we could have, you know, just have said, you know, does a does a um, does a social intervention help people to isolate? You know, there's a there, you know, and you know, because we've got it around about just now, you know, and um, we have you know food banks, food delivery services that will help when people don't have any money, but they can be hard to organise, hard to get through, you know, because they're very busy. And um, sadly, you know, so. So yes, you know, is it is it really worthwhile screening people with half a billion pounds worth of tests, or is it more valuable to actually help people who have to isolate to isolate? And why do you think we we haven't been keen on running these trials for non-drug um, interventions, whatever they are, um, when uh, like throughout the pandemic? Because I think I wonder whether there's there's also this mentality that 
by the time we get our evidence, the pandemic will be over. <laughs> which has been, which has yeah, been sort of proved yeah, wrong um, yeah. as we go from lockdown to lockdown. Yeah, yes, I think that has been wrong. But also, um, there will be other pandemics. You know, the, the, you know, some, you know, this will, you know, the, the whole pattern will be repeated out again at some point in humanity's future. So, you know, I don't see that. You know, if it happens that we get fantastic data and then the pandemic's over, well, terrific. But, <laughs> but I don't think it's invaluable or um, to to look for evidence now where, where we can. And I suppose that the whole issue with non-drug interventions is that we're just not doing enough trials on them at all. And there's a fantastic website called the Bessie Collaboration, which um, registers or, um, or maybe registers the wrong word, which which, um, which follows and, and takes a note of all the non-drug trials that have been done. And there's a handful, you know, very sadly, only a handful. And uh, the big issue is that, you know, the, the drug trials will really only come into effect or relevance to you if you're in hospital, which is a small amount of people but if you are not in hospital and don't have COVID many of the non-drug interventions will be applying to you and yet we don't have good data on whether or not that works and it's just a, a terrible missed opportunity to get better information about what works because that would really let us um, prioritise the things that do work or have got much more likelihood of working and making sure we're doing them right um, and I just feel so sad that um, that when when I've suggested this kind of thing and a few others have as well you know that that um, it's very easy for other people to shut down and say it's a pandemic we don't have time we can't wait for perfect evidence we um you know it's ridiculous to say that we've got to have randomized controlled trials but you know evidence-based medicine is not all about randomized controlled trials it's about reducing uncertainty and it's about trying to make sure you're not doing more harm than good because we know that doctors do do that when they have very good intentions there's no um there's no conspiracy people can think they're doing the right thing and actually be ending up doing, doing very much the wrong thing so to me because it's a pandemic we really need to get high quality evidence it's um it's, it's doubling the efforts to get good information rather than saying we need to be less worried about it and this idea that we don't have time well you know we we sadly have had plenty of time but also you know pragmatic trials are possible you know just um you know you could do stepped wedge trials for example if you've got some kind of intervention you're going to roll out well why not start it two weeks before in one area and then you do somewhere else and and get as many measurables valid um, real life outcomes that, that you can during that period why why would you not want to get that kind of data because then it really allows you to know what's happening you know um, in Denmark they were trying to do a study of schools you know whether schools opening or closing would make a difference and um Having initially said that they would, they would do that, then there was kind of pushback from the government. But I, I think they are hoping to do that as a trial sometime. It, it's just a shame, you know, because we could end up doing stuff, a huge burden to people and to the economy, which is important for people's, you know, for people not to be in poverty. It's not it's not a zero um, sum game here. Um, so we could end up putting all our efforts in the wrong place while not doing the stuff well enough that actually could make a difference. And I, I don't think that's... I don't think that's a bad thing to advocate for. And I'm really surprised, actually, at so many people being opposed to this. I, I just find it extraordinary. I think three things. Firstly, just to echo the idea that actually these non-drug interventions are particularly important because they are applied to such large groups um, right. of people. Something you're doing to uh, imposing on tens of millions of, of people versus perhaps your hospital population is the potential for harms um, yeah. it, are just enormous and they are magnified in the way that with mass vaccination we kind of understand that actually if you're going to give a vaccine to 50 million people in the uk suddenly small percentages of adverse events become quite large numbers the second thing again which we've talked upon uh, about on previous podcast episodes is just this idea that we feel some things must be right by their mechanism we feel that the schools must be shut because how could children not be spreading um covid we feel that uh masks should be working we feel that and Perhaps this kind of comes around and it, yeah, it comes down to we need an acceptance that the things that seem logical are not necessarily the things that are correct. And actually the price to pay for getting good evidence is often quite small compared to the potential negative effects of it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Yes. In fact, my third, my third thread, I don't normally try to talk this for this long. But, <laughs> well, um, it's good to be like um, it, really. My third thing was, um, was on money as well. And I feel like drugs have a lot of funding to them, whereas actually whilst these interventions might cost a lot to put into practice. Actually, do you think we need a, a slight rethink of how funding is allocated 
towards non-profit organisations for studying these sorts of things of the money is yeah, although i suppose a lot of the drugs being studied in covid so far are kind of cheap out of patent drugs aren't they you know things like dexamethasone and hydroxychloroquine mm. you know they're, they're kind of old, old old drugs but you're absolutely right you know things that don't fall easily within a medical model i think do tend to get sidelined i think they're not seeing as being sexy they're they're kind of social interventions they they don't have a they, they don't come as a kind of shiny package thing you know it's, it's like many things in medicine you know housing you know, so, you know social housing you know safe cycling all the kind of stuff that makes a huge impact on local communities um, is, is often just downgraded but if you wanted to apply for a, a big hospital or you know if you if you wanted to um, sort of trial a, a kind of new drug or a breakthrough type thing it's always seen as being much more glamorous and exciting but the, the people that they're trying to collect data in the basic collaboration about why people have been turned down for funding and that'll be really useful to know I think what are the reasons that funders are giving for not supporting research into non-drug interventions because that would be critical to know because um, a lot of the time it's a funding organization's decision you know it's not necessarily the governments who are deciding yes or no mm. and you mentioned um step wedge trials yeah. is there a is there a feeling that um perhaps some of these questions are more difficult to study and that could be one of the reasons um yeah i think they are yeah I, no, no doubt about it. I think it is difficult because you need to do things in people in real time across different organisations. You might have to get a lot of diff different people um, involved from different um, different backgrounds. But you know, there's you know, if we can do this in in hospitals internationally why shouldn't we be able to do this in the community when you've got everyone pulling together, when you've got so much expertise, when you've got amazing public health doctors, epidemiologists, infection control experts, you know, all those people do exist, you know, and, and people do mm. want to do the right thing. They do want to know. I was looking at um, footage in the BBC the other day um, of people in the tube in London, and this is during, you know, a massive stress in London. You know, I think yesterday there's more deaths than there's ever been in the uk and i was looking at the tube train and just absolute overcrowding you know people you know cheek to cheek you know as, as our usual rush hour um, tube train and i just thought in the back of my head do these people think they are being protected because of their face mask do these people have this sense of security that they're wearing this so therefore they're safe i don't know whether that's the answer or not and i wonder you know is this transport system running in the on the um, understanding that face masks are going to be providing a level of protection that is going to outweigh the crowding on these trains just now. I don't know the answer to that, but it makes me really worried that what might be happening is that we're trusting in something that just isn't trustworthy, that's not deserving of the trust that's been put in it. Yes, and I think perhaps when we take a step back, the question is even more complex because we're looking at the, the alternatives as well. Well, if we are going to replace the tube with something we can have tube plus face masks to no face masks, um, invest in alternatives um, for it, which really points towards needing actually decent um, trials and investigations into what is actually happening and what the cost of this one kind of policy decision, which is obviously to um, allow yeah, trains to run as normal and allow people to come to work by that method and not replacing it with anything actually is. Yeah, it's, it's the whole thing is very interesting. At the same time, I see all this stuff about um, people prote um, protesting against um, psychopaths that were built on roads to let people travel outside um, by bike during the pandemic. So they would free up space and tubes and free up um, the need for overcrowding in some areas of London. I just think it's just not joined up. You know, if you've decided that something is harmful, then you really have to look at your whole system, don't you? You can't just look at one aspect of it. But yeah, it's, uh, the whole thing's very difficult and I think we made far more difficult yeah. because we're not expressing our uncertainties enough. Absolutely. We have a slight issue in that some uh, the, it's one thing getting the evidence for non-drug interventions and it's another thing actually making sure that that evidence is acted upon. And I have a gut feeling, I'm not sure if it's right, that actually non-drug interventions, people are less responsive to the evidence around them. People are quite used to seeing a drug trial and thinking, okay, this is practice changing, potentially, we're going to do this. Um, yeah. And I wonder whether one solution could be having individuals sit down before these trials and say, what, what evidence would make you change your mind in it? What evidence would make you um, go forwards and adopt this? And then you can point back and say, listen, you asked for this evidence and you asked for this sort of trial design and we've given it to you. And why is, is this not yeah. accepted? 
So I think it's the doctors who make the decisions about what drugs to prescribe for people or not, whereas it's politicians that tend to make policy decisions after they've had information provided to them and they can ignore that or they cannot. And in some ways that's fair enough, you know, because um, it's not doctors' jobs to say um, when there's going to be a lockdown, for example, that is effectively in the UK, it's a political decision. In other countries it's not, but in the UK it is a political decision. And there's no one thing as the science. There's lots of people who've got their own um ideas about what what we should do and what we shouldn't do and i think it's a, i think the 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 way democracy runs in the uk is that it is the politicians that make their minds up for for everyone i suppose at the end of the day and you could contest that you could say well actually um you know what is the question that you want researchers to answer are you are the politicians asking the question when is the most effective time to put in lockdown or does lockdown work or you know at what point should we place in lockdown what cases would need to be happening where for us to do this most effectively mm. and then saying okay if we show this then that's what we have to do but there's so much judgment involved i suppose it's the same as in medicine you know you you have the evidence and then you have to decide what to do and how to apply the evidence i remember right at the very beginning and um, there was big pressure being put on chris witty to lock down earlier and i remember reports came back of whether or not it's true that he had said no don't lock down yet we don't need to and we're asking we're going to be asking people to lock down for a long time i don't want to start it before we need to i don't know whether or not that was true but it certainly sounded very plausible that someone was actually saying well actually this is not just about what happens now it's about you know we might things might get worse but at that point it might be even harder for people to stay in and do what we're asking them to do if they're already exhausted from having done it you know too early so i don't know mm. It almost requires communication between um, different groups, whereas yeah. doctors can make decisions that might be in the best interest of their patient just there, but might call, might kind of interfere with the broader scheme of things and questions that politicians are really looking to to answer. And equally, politicians might making might make sweeping decisions without the input from. Um, people who say, oh, listen, is this is setting a four four hour? I know we talked last time about a four hour any target. Yeah. Um, but then equally, I, I think that this this strong divide between drug and non-drug, yeah. um, this is the domain of politics. This is the domain of medicine. Yeah. Um, it's perhaps a bit more blurry than. Um, and there used to be this whole public health thing that was um, you know that's very much the job of public health is to be in there trying to work out the best interventions for the population as opposed to doctors treating patients one at a time um, and certainly i think public health um is hugely important and hasn't been supported properly in the uk over the last decade or so and ended up getting involved in all this kind of health check stuff and all the kind of ineffective screening stuff when really um their, their primary role should have been preparing for this kind of thing to happen um or to, to deal with it when it happens and which i think is a real shame because um you know we have you know world-class public health um leadership and physicians in the uk and i just um i just feel that we haven't um the government hasn't allowed them to shine properly as they should have been allowed to they're still working very hard um you know but um so much of the stuff that public health does really well i fear has been taken over by either politicians or by private um, management consultancies to everyone's disbenefit like what, for example? Test and trace would be the, the primary example. You know, um, you know, the system where you try and find people that have been affected with coronavirus. It was being organised by, um, by call centres many miles away from people. And um, public health doctors weren't being given enough um, information to go and find the people that weren't being tested and traced. Um, they they were willing, they were able, but they weren't getting the information through. Um, so and it needs to be done quickly. It needs to be done rapidly. And of course, it was too slow. It wasn't functioning effectively. And um, they were being really left in the dark about their own population which is just absurd so mm. yeah that kind of thing i think i'm sorry margaret i've overrun it's been so lovely to chat um really yeah grateful for you to come back on the podcast um, well listen it's lovely to speak to you again it's really great and um let, let's um i'm really keen to know what you do in your career thanks for listening to the pager podcast if you've enjoyed it do leave us a review share it with a friend and come back to listen to our other episodes as ever, we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us at Pager Podcast on Instagram and Twitter or email us at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Bye for now.